Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you for attending. Again, welcome to our home. So, the uh, my thought this week will deal with something that we're in the middle of. Uh, we have entered a period in the Jewish calendar that we refer to as the three weeks. This period, this is a period that begins a time to re- that we remember and mourn the loss of our temples. Both temples were destroyed on Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. It was no accident that both were destroyed on this day. In the Torah we read that when the children of Israel were freed from their oppressive slavery in Egypt, their first stop was Mount Sinai. And while at the mountain, they received the Torah from God Almighty himself. From there, they were preparing to enter the land of Canaan, which we call Eretz Yisroh, the land of Israel today a land that God promised as an inheritance to our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now the people asked Moshe, their leader, to send spies into the land before they entered. With God's permission, the spies spent 40 days traversing the land. When they returned, well, they gave a, a negative report about the land and the possibility of the nation's chances of being able to conquer the land. Their report caused the people to cry in their tents that night. The spies in their report made it seem that conquering the land would be impossible, even for God. They said that the end result would be that they would all die in the war. The spies took away any confidence that the people possessed. They were basically ready to return to Egypt. Because they cried in their tents, God decreed they would travel in the desert for 40 years. During that 40-year period of time, all those men, between the ages of 20 to 60, that when, they left, when they left Egypt, were sentenced to die in the desert. They had said in the portion of Shalak in the beginning of chapter 14, Lu Mosnu, if only we would, have, we would have died in Egypt or died here in the desert. Well, guess what? God listened and answered their prayer. They died in the desert. It would be their children, the children of Israel, those under the age of 20 and those who were born in the desert, would be the ones to conquer and inherit the land. In addition to those men who were over the age of 60 at the time of the sin, those righteous women of the generation, and the uh, tribe of Levi. In the portion of Kedoshim in the book of Leviticus, the third book, it states, Lo sekal el chayrish, which means do not curse a deaf person. The shock states that the Hebrew word chayrish, deaf person, spelled Ches, Resh, and Shin, is an acronym for the Hebrew words Chaim Royim Shalacha, your bad life. So the verse is telling us, be careful what you wish for. We have a belief that there's an angel who collects all the silly statements and curses that we say about ourselves, in addition to those curses that we say about others. Many times, the things we say are set up out of anger or frustration in the heat of the moment. But we need to know that we are all culpable for the words that cross our lips. The ninth day of the month of Av has been a time of national disaster throughout Jewish history. Both the first and second temples were destroyed on this date. After the destruction of the temple in the city of Jerusalem, the Jews gathered in and around the city of Betar. From there, they mounted a rebellion against Rome that lasted almost six years. The Romans ended the rebellion and brutally butchered its citizens on the 9th of Av in the year 133 CE. One year later, after the revolt on the 9th of Av, the Romans plowed over the Temple Mount. Then on the 9th day of Av in the year 1290, the Jews were expelled from England. In the year 1492, they were expelled from Spain on the 9th day of Av. That brought an end to... That brought an end to... Um, a 1,400-year, a 1,400-year period, which is referred to as the Golden Age of Spain. Historians tell us that World War II was actually a long, drawn-out conclusion of World War I, which began in 1914. All of these events took place on Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. God said to the Jewish nation, "You cried in your tents for nothing. In the future." I will give you what to cry about. 
Now the three-week period begins on the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Tammuz. This date was not chosen randomly. It commemorates the sin of the golden calf. We read in the Torah that the Jewish nation were camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. There they received the Torah from God Almighty himself. After hearing the Ten Commandments directly from God, Moshe then told the people that he would go up to the mountain where he would receive the two tablets of the covenant. These tablets were made of stone, and on them God engraved the Ten Commandments. Moshe told the people before he went up to the mountain that he would return in 40 days. In his count, he did not include the day that he left as one of those 40 days. However, the people did count it as one of their days. When Moshe was late, well, they panicked. They thought that he must have died on the mountain. After all, Moshe had been gone for 40 days and 40 nights, and when he went up to the mountain, he had not taken any provisions with him. So now they felt that they were left without a leader. This was especially true of the Arab Rab, who were the Egyptian intelligentsia, the cream of the crop of Egyptian society, on his own, without consulting with God. Moshe had brought them out of Egypt with the Jewish nation. He had allowed them to join the children of Israel on their journey through the desert. The question that we have to ask is, why did Moshe take the Erevav with the children of Israel when they left Egypt? I find it interesting that we as Jews have been called every derogatory name in the book, every one, every one that is except one. We are never referred to as slaves. <laughs> it's very strange, since both Christians and Muslims, over half of the world population, read the Old Testament. They have read that Avadim Hayyinu the Paro Mitzrayim, that we, the Jewish nation, were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. This fact is repeated, in fact, 50 times in the Torah, so not exactly a secret. So that being the case, why aren't we referred to as slaves? I believe that the Erev Rab, this mixed multitude, gave the Jewish nation credibility. These Egyptians were the brightest and the best that Egypt had to offer. They would not have joined a nation, a slave nation, but they did join a nation that had been enslaved. When the Ava Rab realized that Moshe, the leader who had taken them out of Egypt, was no longer there to lead and advocate for them, they complained to Aaron, Moshe's brother. They told him they needed a leader to take them back to Egypt. In the portion of Kisisa, in the beginning of chapter 32, they said to him, Make for us a God to lead us. Aaron, trying to buy time, told them to bring their gold, and then he would fashion a mold of, of a calf, which he, he would then throw into the fire. They collected all the gold and then iron, then molded the calf, and he threw it into the fire. And when the calf came out of the fire, well, it was walking and talking. The Erevrav, the lowest of the Jewish people, began worshiping it. Aaron told the people, as it states in verse 32.3, Chag Lashem tomorrow, that tomorrow would be a festival to God. Well, the next day was the 17th of Tammuz. Moshe came down from the mountain carrying the two tablets of stone, upon which God had engraved the Ten Commandments. Upon seeing the golden calf, Moshe got angry, and he broke the tablets. He then punished those that had worshipped the calf. He told the people that he would go back up the mountain and plead with God to forgive them. So then he went up the mountain for a second time for another 40 days and 40 nights. The Maral of Prague said that the first 20 days, starting from the 17th of Thomas through the ninth day of Av, were days of divine anger. However, the last 20 days were days of benevolence. Due to this fact, Moshe was able to gain forgiveness for the Jewish nation. When he descended from the mountain after his third visit up the mountain, he brought down with him the second set of tablets. That day was Yom Kippur, and he was able to assure the people that God had forgiven them for their sin. As a sign that God had truly forgiven them, he asked that they build for him a Dira Betachtonim, a dwelling place amongst them here on earth, the tabernacle. Moshe then told them that this day, the tenth day of the month of Tishrei, Yom Kippur would be a day of forgiveness for perpetuity. Even today, we still see Yom Kippur 
as a day of forgiveness and the three weeks as a time when we may be vulnerable to divine retribution. For this reason, it has become the custom of Jews throughout the ages to limit their joy during this period of three weeks. Any construction which is undertaken for the sake of luxury should be postponed. We refrain from buying new clothes or, or even wearing a new garment. We also try not to be involved in litigation during this period. If a court case is scheduled during this period of time, we try to have it postponed until at least after the 15th of the month. So Moshe was able to get, attain forgiveness for the sin of the golden calf, a, a grievous sin. However, the, for the sin of the spies, he was not able to attain absolute forgiveness. The best he could do was to spread the period out over, pardon me, the punishment out over a period of 38 years. Why not? Why wasn't he able to persuade God to forgive the nation just as he did for the sin of the golden calf? When the nation sinned with the golden calf, the people said in the portion of Kisisa, chapter 33, that they realized and admitted their transgression. As a sign of their contrition, the Torah in verse 3 says, And they mourned and they took off their jewelry, what we would call true tshuva, repentance. However, after the sin of the spies, the people told Moshe in the portion of Shalach, Hinenu. We are now ready. They tried to repent, but it was really too late. They acted only after they heard what their punishment would be, as stated in verses 1426 until the end of the chapter. Only then, only then did they entertain thoughts of tshuva. Repentance. When they were told by God that all of those men of military ages, age between the, the ages of 20 to 60, would die in the desert, it would be only Kali ben Yafuna and Yoshua ben Nun, two of the twelve spies who would survive from among all those 600,000 men between the ages of 20 to 60 who had left Egypt. In addition, the nation was sentenced to travel in the desert for 40 years, one year for each day that they spent spying out the land, until all the men of that generation had died. One has to wonder, why was it that God forgave the nation for the making of the golden calf and not for the sin of the spies? With the sin of the golden calf, the people readily admitted that they had sinned before God, however. With the sin of the spies, their admission was faulty. The verse in the portion of Shalach, 1440, states, That God says that we have sinned. In reality, they didn't think that they had sinned. But if God said so, then you know, they would accept his decision. Accepting God's opinion isn't good enough. We see the same scenario played out with Pharaoh and the plagues in Egypt. Time after time, Pharaoh repented and told Moshe that he would let the Jews go out to the desert to serve their God. But that was only while the plague was in process. Pardon me, progress. Once Moshe removed the plague, huh, Pharaoh would revert back to his initial position of not letting the Jews leave Egypt. His temporary repentance was only due to the coercion and difficulty brought about by the plague. In his heart of hearts, Paro never intended to let the Jews leave, even for only three days. This is one of the problems with physical torture. People will say they will admit to anything just to stop the pain. The people managed to make the worst decisions at every chance that they could. First, they cried in their tents. They felt that, God, that though God was strong enough to take them out of Egypt, he could not battle against the 31 kings that occupied the land of Canaan. Then when God told them not to proceed, then they armed themselves and went on the attack anyways. They did, they did so even though Moshe warned them that they would not be successful. Somehow, all of their decisions were contrary to what God and Moshe had told them. So, why do we fast on the 17th of Thomas? The mission in Titus in chapter 4 says that we remember the five calamities that occurred on this date. The first calamity that occurred on this date was when Moshe descended from Mount Sinai with the holy tablets which he broke. The second calamity occurred when the Korban Tumid, the daily sacrificial offering of two sheep, one brought in the morning and the other one brought in the afternoon, was discontinued. 
The third was the 17th day of the month of Thomas in the year 69 CE, when the Romans breached the walls of Jerusalem after a lengthy siege. Three weeks later on Tisha B'Av, they broke through the walls of the Holy Temple and it was destroyed. The fourth calamity was when Apostumus, the wicked, burned a Torah scroll. And the fifth was when an idol was placed inside the temple. The, there are four fasts we observe to commemorate the destruction of the temples. They are the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth. These fast days are the 17th day of Tammuz, Tisha B'Av, Sum Gedalia, the day right after Rosh Hashanah, and the tenth day of Tevin. The question that we ask is, where was God at these times? After all, it seems that he had abandoned his people. So if you add up the numbers 4 plus 5, which is 9, plus 7, which is 16, plus 10, they equal up to 26, which is the numerical value, the gematria of God's name of mercy. Even though we would not be able to see his presence, we always need to know that God and his mercy are always with us. This fact is important for us to remember. God never abandons us. He is always in attendance. There may be times where, when we wonder if he is with us, does he really care? The answer is very evident. Of course he cares. Everything that occurs in our world is directed by him. His concern is for our growth and our happiness. Now, in order to achieve that goal, there are times that he administers tough love. It may seem like he doesn't care, but it's just the opposite. He cares very deeply. Imagine, if you're walking down the street and you see a drunk lying in the gutter, wallowing in his own vomit, what would you do? Probably shake your head and, and think, what a waste of life, and just walk on. Well, what if the person in the gutter was a son of a friend of yours? Well, then you might stop and see if you could help him in some way. But what if the person lying in the gutter is your own son. Hmm. Then your reaction may be totally different. You would probably pick him up by the collar and drag him home, speaking to him all the way about his addiction and his loss of self-respect. You would do anything and everything to get him back on his feet. He is not someone that you can or want to ignore. Well, so to our relationship with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. He cares. We witness that God even cares for the evil person trying to lead him back to a path of goodness and righteousness. We read in the portion of Balak that God tried in every possible way to save Bilaam, the prophet of the nations, from self-destruction. God even sends an angel, the Torah calls the angel the Satan, Satan, to help Bilaam. Rashi states that this was an angel of mercy. So even the angel that we see as our greatest adversary is in reality there to help us succeed on our journey through this minefield that we call life. God even creates a miracle to try and save Bilaam from disaster. He opens up the mouth of Bilaam's donkey and has to speak with him. Even that wasn't seen by him as a wake-up call. Somehow a donkey, a simple animal, was able to see that which Bilaam, a prophet of God, could not see. Seeing in life is more than about opening one's eyes. We must have vision. We need to see the world with our inner godly eye. So we can only imagine that if God, our loving Father, is concerned about an evil individual such as Bilaam, how much more so would he be concerned about the average person trying to live their life as best as they can? God doesn't want to punish us. He would much rather pamper us with all the goodness that exists in the world. You know, there are times much like today when the world is dealing with this pandemic and it seems like the whole world has gone crazy. God is giving us a message. We need to open up our minds and our hearts and listen. It is a time for us to reach out and help others try and make this world a better place, a more godly place. You know, going back to how things were in the past, it's not good enough. We need to utilize the experience and lessons that we have learned during these difficult times and grow. We need to work on becoming better children to our Father in Heaven. 
You know, fasting is not something that we observe just because we have been told it is a mitzvah, a command from the Torah. We fast as a symbolic sacrifice to God our Father in heaven. In the time of the temple, we would bring a sacrifice, a gift offering to God. Today, by fasting, we sacrifice some of our body mass through our fast. We are not trying to punish our bodies as much as we are trying to connect our minds, our spiritual, be our be spiritual beings. We are just trying to remind ourselves that we should take nothing for granted. Everything that we possess comes from God Almighty. I think that this pandemic is a sign for all of us that there is a God in the world and we need to acknowledge his presence in our lives. Look around you. Listen, the alarm clock is ringing. It's time for all of us to wake up. And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach to Canaan quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you very much for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with health and happiness and success, safety. Again, all that is good. Again, let us try to make the three weeks Bible and an important movement in our life to move further and closer to God. God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom and be well.